do. But uh, I got to thinking, just how much am I willing uh, to give that my culture, that my uh, generation, that my children's generation might know Jesus? Just how much am I willing to give? And of course, in our family, we love to read about missionaries. Actually, every day, we open up Operation World. And uh, at our dinner table, we talk about one of the nations of the world. Yesterday was, I believe, Madagascar, wasn't it, son? And uh, so we, we talk about these nations and talk about the situations they're facing. And uh, it's just something I want to keep in front of me. But we pray at the end, Lord, we want you to call us to some of these nations. So if you're call calling, we're hearing, we want to obey, just tell us. Uh, and sometimes there are calls like that. Sometimes it's just the right thing to do. Uh, you know that. You don't have to have a special calling to do some things. You just do them. Uh, and I'm wondering more and more if missions end a little bit like that. There's just some things you just need to do. Uh, having said that, I've asked the question myself. How much am I willing to give up? I'm going to take you through some places before we get to that point. But December 2013, uh, GQ magazine, which I'm sure everybody here reads, uh, mm -hmm came out with their GQ Man of the Year, which I was shocked it wasn't Gary Carl, but no, they came out with it. <laughs> I mean, what a magazine this is. Yeah, 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 you know. He says that in front of you, but he knows. Uh, Matthew McConaughey came out, uh, and he was the Man of the Year. So, you know, just to talk about Matthew a little bit, what's, what's he thinking, what's some of his reflections on life, and this is one of the things he had to say. He said, I'm a big fan of the word selfish. Self-ish. When I say I've gotten a little more selfish, I really mean a lot more selfish. I mean, I'm less concerned with what people think of me. Selfish has gotten a bad rap. You should do for you. Kind of reminds me of a TV evangelist I've heard just lately. You don't worship God for God, you worship God for you. Well, a few pages later, in this GQ magazine, uh, there was an award-winning fiction writer named George Saunders, who I don't know about. But uh, nonetheless, a writer, and they call him the life coach of the year in GQ magazine. Well, let's see what he has to say. He said, the big kahuna of all moral questions, as far as I'm concerned, is ego. How do you correct the fundamental misperception that we are all born with, I am central? All of the nasty stuff in this life comes out of that misunderstanding. That's fascinating, isn't it? Man of the year says, hey, live for you. The other guy, life coach you there saying, if you want to mess up the world, live for you. So, you should do for you or you should get over yourself. Which worldview do we embrace? Now, I know which one we say we embrace, but sometimes there's a big difference between what we say we embrace and what actually folds out in our life. So, I, uh, we were doing an uh, interesting little study we have begun a study at our church in the book of Judges. Is it possible to live so much for you that God gets ticked off? And we say, well, I don't think so. God's love for us is unconditional, we say. And in one very real sense, that's true. But I asked my congregation on, on Sunday, I said, is it possible that you, you could like somebody and still be awful mad at them? So I, I was looking for this book of Judges thing where it says in chapter 2 that God was angry with him. He was mad at him. And this is what he did to him, based on that anger. So I wondered about that, and I, I began to look up some images so I could put it in my PowerPoint on Sunday morning. And I went to, I thought, well, let's just see what images Google can give me when I punch up the words, God is mad at you. <laughs> so I did, guess what? There's a whole industry out there trying to convince you there's no way God is mad at you. No way. God is not, in fact, there's an important evangelical book out right now. God is not mad at you. There's seminars. God is not mad at you. If you're thinking God's ticked off with you, it's a lie. He's not. I'm thinking, boy, you've got to be pretty bald-faced to say that. Because apparently, scripturally, it's a real possibility that God could get mad at you. And so, you got your Bibles. So I want to turn to Romans 1. And uh, I've become a fan of words. I like to look words up. I like to see what the definitions are. I like to see what the Greek word means, where it comes from, Hebrew words mean. Hebrew is a lot funner than Greek, actually, but because it's a little looser. Maybe you take a little bit more liberty during your sermon with, uh, with Hebrew. But uh, 
I can tell you, God does appear harsh sometimes in Scripture. Uh, I think Romans 1 is one of those places. And if you look at Romans, let's go with about 1, 24 or so. Yeah, let's start with 21, just to see what the, predicament, or the real predicament of the time was. Although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over. Now, the word here is paradidomai. It comes up in a number, a number of places and a number of ways in Scripture. But therefore, God gave them over. And the sinful desires of their hearts as sexual impurities for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worship and serve created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. 26. Because of this, God gave them over. Paradidomai. To shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Verse 28. Therefore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, He gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. And this is where it all leads. Verse 29. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. They're gossips. So interesting. That's right in the middle of that paragraph, isn't it? Um, gossips. Gossips. Slanderers. God-haters. Insolent. Arrogant. Boastful. They invent ways. <laughs> they invent ways of doing evil. I'm, I'm thinking right now the new technology is coming out every year in America. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. Senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Incredible. God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. The word paradidomai. Now it's variously translated. It might be gave them up. God abandoned them. God delivered them over. Those are three real quick translations. But I'm mindful of this. It was about 30 years ago, I think, when I read something about by Carl Henry. You may remember Carl Henry. He's kind of a... I don't know how to describe it exactly. Maybe you could describe it as the theologian for the whole Billy Graham movement. Uh, good friends with Billy Graham. They loved him and they, they embraced him. But he once suggested that the word paradidomai was one of the most thunderous words of the New Testament. And then shockingly added that he wondered whether or not God had already done the paradidomai thing to America. That it already happened. It's over. And what we've seen since then has basically been paragraph we just read. Worse and worse. Or, you know, in the book of Judges, God does get mad, and what happens is, uh, you see the people who are crying out to God, God sends in the judge, they get saved by the judge, and then they go right back to the ways they're doing things. And they call it the seven cycles of disobedient and judges. It just gets worse and worse and worse before every man's doing what's right in his own eyes. Everybody's doing what they think is right. Not what Yahweh, not what God thinks is right. And so, Carl Henry says this, I think we're now living, this is from the Christian century. I'm trying to get a date on it real quick here. Christian century, you yeah, I actually footnoted this, 1980. I think we're now living in the very decade when God may thunder his awesome paradidomai over America's professed greatness. Our massacre of a million fetuses a year, our deliberate flight from the monogamous family, our normal, normalizing of fornication, and homosexuality and other sexual perversion, our programming of self-indulgence above social and familial concerns. All this represents a quantum leap in moral deterioration, a leap more awesome than even the supposed qualitative goal between conventional weapons and nuclear missiles. Our nation has all but tripped the worst ratings on God's scale of fully deserved moral judgment. Now we want to have a theology that says, God would never do that to us. No way would he do that to God-loving Christian America. After expressing his hesed agape love in our lives across the millennia, and in this country, 
for the last 200 plus years. And our rejection of him, why wouldn't he? The human race through Pilate expresses what we do to him every day. And that is, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate had Jesus flogged and handed him over, paradidomai, to be crucified. Maybe we protest too much. I'm reminded remind of uh, Billy Graham's daughter, M. Graham Lotz. She was on the early show years ago. She got in trouble for this. We made fun of her for a full three or four weeks after this comment. But Jane Clayson asked her, how could God let something like this happen? This is what Ann Graham said. I believe God is deeply saddened by this, just as we are. But for years, we've been telling God to get out of our schools, get out of our government, get out of our lives. And being the gentleman he is, I believe he has calmly done what we wanted. He backed out. How can we expect God to give us his blessing and his protection if we demand that he leave us alone? I'm not so sure that was actually the most appropriate thing to say after Hurricane Katrina, but it was one of the things that was said. We need to hear it, whether it's appropriate at that time or not. Now, that's Romans 1. I've begun doing something in my life that's been very helpful. Uh, I think we all ought to be taking the means of grace seriously and and I want to take all of them seriously, except there's a lot of ways that grace can uh, ride into our lives and being cognizant of that. I have absolutely not done this for a long time. With the family, the freedom and dinner table, we memorize scripture, bunches of scripture. Uh, not as much as other families, I get that, but we probably know together about 500 verses of scripture that we quote every day. Big, long passages. Uh, but I personally have not done it. I have not memorized scripture. I just have not done it. That has not been a means of grace for me. So I kind of repented of that several weeks ago. I said, man, I need to get back in it. So I went and got the navigator's uh, cards and started memorizing. And I started memorizing what they wanted me to memorize. Then I started using the blank cards. They give you a book where there's a bunch of them. So I took, start taking out the blank ones and start writing in those verses I wanted to memorize. Verses I think that maybe be a little more important than the ones they were giving me. But one of the ones they had me memorize was Galatians 2.20. You know this one? I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the body, I now live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and paradidomine. How cool is that? I'm all of a sudden disagreeing with one of the preeminent theologians in 20th century America. Paradidomine is not necessarily the scariest word in the New Testament. Because it can be used in other ways. And apparently we have at least three choices here. We can't allow God to give us up. That's our own choice by saying, hey, listen, I'm going to do what I want you to do. You can buck out of here. And you can say that sometimes even while saying, I like Jesus. You can do that even while praising Him during a worship service. You can say to Him, yeah, I like to lift my hands, and I'd love to see these new contemporary songs, but at the end of the day, I want it my way. So, God will eventually say to you, maybe here, certainly at Judgment Day, I give you up. Or, we can give him up. Just say, later, I'm walking away. Or, we can allow him to give himself up for us. Mm. Now, isn't that precious? And I think that's exactly where God wants us to live. He has decided to give himself up for us. So apparently we have a choice. Now, I'd like for you to turn your Bibles to Genesis 18. I'm going to take you for a little ride here. It might even be a boring ride. I'm going to go ahead and let you know that right up front. But it's an interesting one if you can just hang in there a little while. I did this with my congregation the other day. I promised boredom and and uh, they were able to hang in there with me pretty well. <laughs> Genesis 18, 20 to 26. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down to see if what they've done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Well, the men turned away and went towards Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? 
What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And you know the rest of the story. Now, where I want to go with this is going to be a little bit surprising. I was with, uh, I was at a Nazarene meeting of some kind, I forget. And a guy sitting across from me says, uh, have you ever heard of Dennis Kinlaw? I said, well, yeah, sure. I mean, he's been on the board of Wesley Biblical Seminary. He's a guy we like to read, a guy we pay attention to, a guy that we love. He's in our tradition. We just, yeah, I know Dennis Kinlaw. He says, have you ever heard him preach? Just heard him preach. I plagiarize him all the time. I love Dennis Kinlaw. Everybody who wants to fill up the seminary has been impacted him in some substantial way. He says, well, have you ever heard him speak on the emanations of the scribes? I said, excuse me? And he starts talking and he loses me. But I'm, I'm going to lose you here in just a moment if you don't really try to pay attention. He, lo he lost me. I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know. You can kind of tell with Matt Freedom. And I'm looking at you, you know, but it, I ain't there. <laughs> Isn't there a, there a term for that? Something. I don't know. The curtain is open, but the play is not happening. Okay, so whatever. I mean, I'm just not there. But I'll continue to intently look at you and nod my head. I, I've got that figured out around here. I've sat through enough meetings where I have to do that around here. So yes, yes. I'm yes. What do you think about that, Matt? And I'll try to deflect it to somebody else because I haven't been listening. For a so here at Wesley Biblical Seminary, we believe in scriptural inerrancy. Amen? Amen. I actually, we teach that at Day Spring. We believe in inerrancy. And we teach it in such a way that I say, and I, I've actually never told him this, but your denomination doesn't. But here at Dayspring, we believe in scriptural inerrancy. Absolutely, amen, and hallelujah, down the glory. We explain it sometimes, but it basically goes back to it's inerrant in the original autographs. We don't have the original autographs, but we have pretty much everything we know the original autographs have right there, I mean, to the nth degree. A very sophisticated study of ancient documents, it shows that the Bible is undeniably accurate to the, again, the nth degree. Far more so than any other ancient document. No one bothers to doubt the other ancient documents, but if you're a skeptic, you want to somehow doubt the Bible. If you're thinking, if you know the science, if you know the research, it's hard to do that. Now, because of the great reverence the Jewish scribes held toward the scriptures, they exercised extreme, extreme care in making new copies of the Hebrew Bible. And to make them, you didn't get the chance of Xerox. You didn't get a chance to push a button on your computer and hope they'd drop out somewhere else. You had to write out. And you can imagine. I do this sometimes. My wife will give me a message. I'll write it down. And someone else will write it down. And there's 40 mistakes before it finally gets to the kid who needs to have the information. That's not what happened here. Because of the great reverence they had, they had extreme care and extreme caution in making these new copies. The entire scribal process was specified in meticulous detail. They weren't going to put up with the slightest error. The number of letters and words and lines were counted. And the middle letters of the Pentateuch and of the Old Testament were determined. They knew the middle letter of the law. And so, once it was all done, they would count up all the letters in front of it, all the letters behind it, and if you had that single letter there, they thought, we have an accurate copy. If it wasn't there, they trashed it. Can you imagine writing out the whole Old Testament, the whole law, and have your copy trashed because you didn't get the middle letter right? Single mistake was discovered. It was all destroyed. Now, during the early part of the 10th century, about 916 AD or so, there was a group of Jews called the Masoretes. These Jews were meticulous in their copying. They had, what they had were all capital letters, there was no punctuation or paragraphs, but they would copy Isaiah, for example. And again, when they were done, they would total up the number of letters, they'd find the middle letter, if it wasn't the same, they made a new copy. All of the present copies of the Hebrew text which come from this period are in remarkable agreement. You can imagine why. They took it seriously. When the scribes prepared to copy a manuscript, he was required to wash his hands. Soiled hands should never touch holy things. When he was finished, he would wash his hands again because hands that had holiness on them were not supposed to touch common things. Boy, 
they, they finally found, eventually, the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. And it provided a significant check on all of this because the Hebrew scrolls were ahead of the earliest Old Testament manuscript they had by about a thousand years. And in spite of that thousand year time period, the number of variant readings between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic text, very, very, very small. Most variations weren't spelling or style. So, I want to go right now to Genesis 18. Are you with me still? You bored yet? Ava, don't yawn during the sermon, mom, please. <laughs> Genesis 18, 22. It says, Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Now, in your Bible, check it. Is there a little letter or a number or something right behind that line? Because in my Bible, there is. It takes you down to a little footnote at the bottom of the page. When scribes were copying the manuscript, you were not allowed to change anything. In fact, if the scribe before you made a mistake, you were not even allowed to change his mistake. What you could do is write the correction in the margin if you were absolutely sure, sure, something had gone askew, something had gone awry. But of the 31,173 verses of the Bible, the scribes did change a few words of the text. If there was a problem that seemed so glaring to the scribes, there ain't no way that ought to be there. A few times, they just couldn't help themselves. So sometimes these what we call scribal emendations were made to avoid potential problems in public reading. So for instance, bodily functions, I'll let your mind wander here for two seconds. Bodily functions and the like would be changed with euphemisms. Because this is gonna be embarrassing when we read it in public. The best scholarship says of verses 22, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord, that's not the best rendering. Yahweh remained standing before Abraham is what scholars suggest it ought to be. Now in those days, sitting down was the posture of authority. Someone standing in front of you meant he was not the authority, not the king, not the most respected one in the room. So remember what's just happened. God has just finished telling Abraham He's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And now he stops and looks at Abraham, just begging with his standing presence for this creature he has made to voice some kind of objection. But it's God standing before Abraham. Now why would the scribe have felt the need to change it from God standing to Abraham standing? Because God standing was too irreverent. I mean, it was blasphemous. Yahweh, the God of all gods, the king of all kings, the immortal, the everlasting, the creator of all things and of all creatures, the most powerful in all the universe, standing in humility before a mere mortal and petitioning him? No way. Somebody changed it. Now we have the advantage the scribes didn't have. And it's this. We get to read Abraham with the story of Jesus clanging around in our cranes. And you remember the story of Jesus? To the church of Philippi, Paul wrote this. And the same mindset is Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in human appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. We serve a God that doesn't just stand in front of us, but he hung in front of us mm. in amazing humility. And with that understanding, we can look back at Genesis 18 and see how maybe, just maybe, there was a mistake made. God stood before us, actually hung on a cross before us in incredible humility. Now here's the point, and this is what I want to get at, and this won't take much longer from here, but this. The typical evangelistic plea is Jesus did this for you to get you into heaven. But what if from that cross, 
What if from that position of being in front of you, he says, follow me? Now, he did it to save you. He did it to save all of us, all our tribe, all of our people. He did it. But what if he says from the cross, now I want you to follow me? And the question becomes, am I willing to die that somebody might know Jesus? Am I willing to put my life on the line that someone might know him? Are you willing to die for somebody? Who are you willing to completely and totally humble yourself before in order to win them to the kingdom cause? Somebody went up to somebody a couple weeks ago and said, boy, this, this thing of ISIS, the Middle East, this is crazy. Man, they're killing babies. I said, yeah, let's pray for it. I said, yeah, let's pray. I tell, the guy said, I'll tell you something else. If that was in my zip code, I'd be down there doing something about it. They get done praying and the person says, you know, they are cutting off heads of babies in your zip code. And actually in this zip code, two miles away from here, there's a man they fly in from North Carolina to cut off the heads of babies. We've gotten so used to it, we don't even think about it. And when someone actually would bring that up in a sermon, we just wish you'd go the next topic. But they're doing it. I don't think Jesus would even say die for that, but could just show up and pray. I had someone the other day, I am actually doing a little bit of a podcast now, and she was on it. Oh boy, I tell you, that thing went across the nation. Lots of people heard it. She talked about how she was raped twice. Second time she had a child. What am I going to do with this child? We'll, we'll abort the child. And she did. She aborted the child. And she says to me, Matt, if anybody would have been out there to say, sweetheart, we can help you. Don't do this. In the name of Jesus, don't do this. I wouldn't have done it. No one was there. All across the nation, there are lots of no ones there in front of places where they cut the heads off the babies. And we are concerned about ISIS. Let us be concerned about ISIS. We don't have to go two miles from here to see a similar situation. We don't care. Am I willing to die that someone else might live? I, uh, years ago, I dawned on me. I'm the professor of evangelism here, for crying out loud. How many people have I won to Jesus Christ this year? Shoot. How many have I led to Jesus Christ in the last five years? It got to me all of a sudden. I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a seminary professor. But my whole life was this building, my church, and my house. I don't even go to Kroger. My wife does that. I got three places where I live. So I live between these places and going up and down the street. And I'm thinking, I don't ever see an unsafe person. I'm around the holy crowd all the time. It just broke my heart. And all of a sudden I recognized Wesley Bible saying was have the worst evangelism professor in its history. So, by the way, I've learned that almost no evangelism professors in the nation lead anybody to Jesus. That's what I've learned since then. But it broke my heart that day. That's why I said, I gotta change this. I gotta get around unholy people. So I thought, well, where are the unholy people? And it dawned on me, I bet there's a few unholy people in prison. And I've tried to go out there ever since, weekly, just to be among some guys that need to know Jesus, that need to know some guys who know actually more verses than I know, but they've never let them seep down into their hearts and into their minds and into their imaginations. Guys that can live a holy life in jail, but when they leave that jail, they're going right back to the same community, doing the same bad, raunchy things. And I thought to myself, could I somehow get to know some of those guys? come to aid to some of those guys. I've been very proud to see Becky kind of rise up from her office and go do the same kind of thing. It is a beautiful thing to say, I may not die today, but can I at least move that someone else might know Jesus? I start something this year 
Um, can't wait to sit, share some of these things in classes, but I've learned quite a bit in the last couple of months. We're doing some things evangelistically in our uh, in our church. Got a thing that we're going to be doing all year long. Going to kind of look up uh, next year at this time and see how it's worked. But I asked for some people who would be willing to be on the front line of Day Springs evangelism. Who would like to be the front line evangelist of this church? I'd like for you to sign that piece of paper there and hand it in at the end. And uh, a number of them did. Then it dawned on me I really didn't have the tool I needed to uh, to get put through the hand. So I just made it this week. I want to get these people together. And this is what this is. This comes from a guy, a Southern Baptist guy named Elmer Towns. Uh, he used to have a booklet. The booklet's no longer in print. So I just took the gist of what he did. And this is what it is. Uh, you find someone who is unchurched. So Carl, let's say you're unchurched. And I, so I'm going to write your name now. Carl Lumen. Spouse, Becky. Birthday, anniversary. You're going to have your address. Uh, any children you might have. Any hobbies you have. I'm just trying to get to know you. And what you do with this information is say, Lord, I'm going to pay attention to some of these things. Like their kids. How can I be kind to them? How can I celebrate their birthday? How can I help them celebrate their anniversary with a donut? You know, 7.45 on a Monday morning or something. How can I reach out somewhere or another. Then it has a list of 365 days here. And you're supposed to check off how you prayed for this person. So did you pray? Prayer works. Now, we believe in aura et labora, prayer and work, but we believe in something more than just work. We believe in prayer. So let's pray. So let me just check off here. Have I prayed for this person? I've prayed for the prevenient grace of the Holy Spirit to go before me and to go before my church and soften and tenderize and work on these people. They might be ready to receive whatever God has for them. Then up here, seven touches. We have on pretty good research that in order to develop a relationship with somebody, you need at least seven touches, loving touches, things like this. I go out and eat with them. I pick up the bill. I, I pay for us to go out to a sports outing. I, I take them to church. I go hunting and fishing with them. I throw them a birthday party. Uh, I mow their lawn. Share food with them somewhere or another. Provide transportation. Babysit. Clean house for them. Help meet some kind of financial need. Send a card, birthday, anniversary, some kind of encouragement, congratulations, thank you. Just seven ways. And I say circle one of these if you've done them. There could be other things you do. But that's building relationships because we know this. If you share the gospel, I'm not saying don't do it, but we know that if you share the gospel with a stranger, they may say yes, but they won't live out that less very long because you're not related to them. They got the gospel for someone they weren't related to. That works sometimes. Very, very few times does that work. What does work is you built a loving relationship with someone, then you share the message, and then they're wide open to your message. So I had to hear three hearings, because we know that in the day of Billy Graham, people pretty much knew the gospel. So he was saying, receive that gospel that you already know. That's not exactly how I framed it, but most people knew the story of Gideon. Most people knew the story of the blind man, Bartimaeus. Most people knew these things, so therefore, they would pick up on it, receive it, and go. Now they don't. So they need to hear the gospel 2.6 times. Since I think it's a little difficult to hear the gospel 2.6 times, we just put it up to three. And say, your testimony. You need to share your testimony with these people. Uh, you need to take them to a friend day at your church, some evangelistic service, a Christmas or Easter program. Give them a gift of a book. Say, listen, read that first chapter. I'm going to talk about it next week when we get back together. Uh, visit a friend with his, and, and his testimony. So I'm going to take Carl to visit this unchurched friend. I'm going to sit down and say, Carl, tell him how your life was so dramatically changed. I want to hear it again, too. And Carl talks about the gospel, how Jesus touched his life. And here's this guy's captive audience because I just paid for his meal. Uh, watch a movie with him, a movie that has some kind of great message, and then talk about that movie afterwards. And then, of course, include Jesus and, and the gospel and all that. I asked Dayspring, how many of you? And what I asked for was, is there 15 people here that would say, I will touch four friends in the next six months using seven loving touches and three hearings of the gospel and praying every day for them? Sign up for it. I got about uh, eight. I'll take eight. I said, let's go. Let's go. You know how many churches don't have a single convert this year? 50% of all churches in America, not one person brought to Jesus. Can you imagine if we got eight, reaching out to four, and we got half? That makes us one of the most evangelistic churches in America. Let alone what we're doing in prison ministry, abortion clinic ministry, strip club ministry, and anything else my church is doing. 
Just that alone. Let's reach out to our friends, our relatives, our associates, and our neighbors. And someone's going to say, I don't know. But, you know. Don't make your thing my thing, will you? And I'm thinking, freedom and you they used to be just like that. Don't get annoyed at that guy. You used to be that guy. Don't make your thing my thing, man. And now I'm hearing Jesus. I'm seeing Jesus stand in front of me. <laughs> saying, dude, I died for you. Who are you willing to die for? And it says two words. Follow me. Who are you willing to share the gospel with? Maybe even die for. Who are you willing to lovingly touch for the gospel? Who are you willing to ensure that they get three hearings of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Who are you willing to pray for? They might say yes. What prison are you willing to go to? What abortion clinic are you willing to rise up and be a part of? A strip club? Whatever else it might be. This is a hurting world. It may be a post paradidomite world, but I believe even in that world, God's still working. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, could you use us? We, the people of Wesley Biblical Seminary, simply want to say, your will for my life is what I want. Wherever you lead, I will follow. Tell me exactly what that means. In exceedingly practical terms, Tell me what that means. We will obey. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. God bless.